thank you uh, otis uh, so we meet after a break of uh, two weeks in between uh, on account of spring break and last week we you, you said you didn't get any submissions there was only one submission so it didn't make much sense to meet uh, just for uh, to review one writing sample uh, i hope you know we have a good enough uh, 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 you know volume of submissions this time so for those of you who are joining in for the first time or even for those who have joined earlier in just a couple of minutes i will be making all of you participants as panelists so you will be able to share your video and unmute yourselves and uh, and talk uh, and the way it works is uh, you go to the indic academy website there's a link there you can uh, send email your writing sample about 800 words in length to otis at the email mentioned and you send it as a pdf document in a particular uh, you know style template so it's easier for otis to read and review and mark his feedback he sends uh, his feedback uh, back to you via an email and then when we meet on a sunday like we are now he will go through those submissions uh, uh, one by one he'll uh, walk uh, us uh, everyone for you know to see uh, what the feedback is and uh, uh, give his opinion and share some you know good writing practices tips and other things and one of the things that he has been doing very frequently if you have uh, not noticed his point of view so that is something that i know is important to, to focus on and get right i hope i will one of these days but uh, uh over to you otis all right uh thanks um yeah point of view is is important and our ability to control the point of view that's the right that's the writing issue for us for us to be able to move it around and know where it is for example um and do that on purpose um well great i have uh I have three works uh, this week, but I also feel like we um, were a little bit quick with Rashma, um, I guess now three weeks ago. So, and, and it's not, it, for me, it's understandable. I don't know, I'm, I'm very forgiving of these things. You know, we got out of our uh, schedule a little bit because I had my break and then um, we didn't have, we only had a couple submissions. So, I mean, these things build up momentum. If, if I'm going to give a writing tip, habit is the writing tip. Habit. You develop a writing habit. It is the number one thing that you want to do. Basically, I attribute, if I have some success, which is arguable, but if I have success, I, I attribute it to two things, two things only. That when I was in high school, someone taught me to type by not looking at the keys. Okay, so that person I owe everything to. And then the second thing is um, to get a little book like this and write down every single day what you have written and and work to write. Okay, I know this is going to shock you. This is going to shock you. Prepare yourself. Breathe for five minutes each day. That's it. Just write for five minutes every day. If you're going to do it like I do it, you have a ritual. I grind my coffee in the morning. My mind is empty of all things. Grind the coffee. Pack the little Breville. I can tell you which one I have. Pack it. I know how to make it. I can make my coffee. My subconscious mind makes my coffee. I'm telling you. I make it. I walk out. My mind is empty. I have not looked at an email. I have not gotten on Facebook. My God, stay away from me. I have done nothing. And I sit down and I open the thing that I'm working on that, um, that I've been thinking about actually starting in the evening before. And then I and my, my subconscious mind is ready to type five minutes a day. Those two things. If you're not writing regularly, I strongly suggest, let me give you a page that shows you. Okay. That's, I just write when I start the date, when I start and when I stop. And if I don't write, I write the date and I write just no writing. I don't 
I'm not mad at myself. I don't write the next day for 10 minutes. Okay, I'm not castigating myself and saying I'm a bad person. What I'm saying to myself is I needed to rest. I needed to rest, that's all. If I take two days off, I needed to rest for two days. It's simple. I'm not mad, okay? So that's my habit, habit, habit. So, so do try and develop that, whether we, whether we meet or not, try to get into the habit of writing every day. I, I can tell you at this point, I've been doing it for over, probably over 12 years. And the rewards are incredible uh, for me. I just say personally, I mean, I, I just my ability to have writing just flow, um, it, it's remarkable. And the way I can think is remarkable. And I'm just, I'm actually honestly just so thankful for it. It's not, it's not because of me, I haven't earned anything. I'm just thankful that, that that's part of the human capacity to engage in the imagination like that. So, uh, okay, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Rashma's work. Uh, so we've, um, I mean, I think it's, I do think about this and hopefully we can organize over time so that you can share your work with each other and give each other feedback. And, uh, you know, maybe there's a core group that develops and, and you can figure something out in that regard, or maybe at some point we can figure out a more developed workshop model. In the traditional workshop model, uh, the, the students in the workshop all hand in work to everybody. Everybody reads it. And then, you know, if I'm the facilitator, then I basically organize a conversation around uh, the work from everyone. So maybe that'll be possible at some time because you can learn so much from other people in workshops. And I think that honestly, I've learned the most, the, the, the thing that I've learned from the most is reading other people's work and saying, huh, okay, I like that. I want to be able to do something like that. So I steal that, right? And then I say, wait a second, I don't like this, right? And I write a little criticism like, um, I don't think you should, Ashvani, you'll, you'll, you'll get this one. Uh, I'm not sure that you should use so many adverbs. And then by God, by God, I better not use adverbs in the work that I then submit to everyone. Because now that I've called out that I don't think adverbs are a good idea, well, then I better not do it myself. And this way we learn and develop our technique. Um, so anyway, this, this, is a, you know, this is a work of play. It's wonderful, uh, a wonderful play. Um, it does some of the things that I think Honestly, it's the level, this is the level that we want to arrive at. And then from here, everything else is like fine tuning. Now you're, you're in the realm, you're in the arena, but the arena is this, you're getting characters on the page. You're getting, and by characters, I do not mean cardboard cutouts. I mean, human beings on the page. I can see and feel and understand that I'm, as I read this play, I'm seeing human beings. Right, thank you. I, I, I really wanna say how amazing I think that that is. I, I, I'm of my maxims, right? One of my maxims is write five minutes a day. Okay, obviously you write more than that, but do stop, okay? You can't let the rest of the world go. We have to take care of the rest of the world because if we don't take care of that, then we can't write for five minutes a day. And we don't want that ever. So we got to take care of everything else too. But the other maxim is people are miracles. And, and I mean that universally. So personally, I mean that universally. I don't think that they're good people and bad people. Okay. I don't think they're not people that I like and I don't like. Uh, they're miraculous. Well, there are people I like and I don't like. But human beings' miraculousness is universal. And so you want to get that miraculousness on the page. You do not, and from the writer's point of view, and I mean this so sincerely, it's hard to even gauge it. 
we are not writing people in order to judge them because honestly, who the hell are we, right? So we as authors, as writers are simply trying to get the characters on the page. We are not trying to judge them. And if we get the characters on the page, we have done something miraculous. And then what we capture is we capture the, the interaction of those characters. The, in Rashma's work, which is a play, it is significantly different from when we're writing, let's say narrative fiction from within a point of view, because it's a different, it's a different presentation, right? Rashma, you you know this and yeah. all of us, we can yeah. think about this somewhat conceptually, but like the main thing is when we have a play, we have an audience that's watching everybody, right? So we're seeing, an in, we're seeing this, we're watching and we're seeing this interaction of a group of human beings and we're, we're essentially on the outside of that experience, right? So we're here watching to do those eyeballs, eyeballs watching a group of people interact. And so, and this is gonna to speak to Rashma in a minute. She had a question about, you know, where she has so many threads and so many themes going on now in her work. What, what are you finally going to end up saying about it? Well, because of this relationship of being on the outside and looking at the group, you're really saying something about, you're, you're gonna end up saying something about the group, right? Um, and I'm, this is gonna be our Anton Chekhov day because I'm gonna to talk to Ashvani about Chekhov too. And, <laughs> and Rashma, I'm gonna to talk to you about Chekhov, but we're talking to you about the cherry orchard, obviously, and we're talking to Ashvani about uh, the collected stories of Anton Chekhov, which is an assignment that I'm giving you. Um, but anyway, so the audience is looking at the group. And so we're not actually in one character's point of view, right? So we're, we're really experiencing the whole group. And so the play is going to say something about the whole group. The, the fiction narrative will also say something about humanity. So Joseph Conrad said, the story is not like a kernel in a nut. It is the glow that brings out the haze meaning it's the glow that, that sheds light on the nature of the world. But the story in that case is a much more acute struggle between a protagonist and an antagonist, a protagonist in the entire world. And in the narrative fiction, we're inside the point of view of the character. I'm gonna say something else sort of complicated. If we're writing narrative fiction with multiple points of view, then the story is going to be about those multiple points of view. So when I was at Stanford, I someone submitted a story that was about four people in the family and a boyfriend. So that was weird to me. <laughs> I was like, four people in the family makes sense, plus a boyfriend didn't make sense to me. But anyway, let's say it's just about the four people in the family and it had it had alternating points of view in the chapters. And if you've read um, Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections, which I suggest, it's a, it's a pretty masterful novel that explores point of view. That also has a family and has four points of view and it represents all of them. Then the story is finally going to be about not any one individual in the story, but the family. The family is the protagonist. So that means, so the way, what it means to be the protagonist is that they're the ones who change. That's what it means. They've gone through a journey and they've come to some point of change. It can either be a positive change or a negative change, basically. A positive change, from my point of view, that's how I describe comedy. A negative change is how I describe tragedy. But whether they make a positive change or a negative change, the audience basically sees the point of choice. And if they've made a positive choice, if they made a positive choice, they make the audience makes that choice with them. But if they make a tragic choice, the audience basically 
uh, divorces themselves from that choice and makes a positive choice. Does it? Does that make some kind of weird sense? Okay. So that's a that's like a broad that's a broad statement that's sort of getting involved in this piece. Um, let me. Sorry, I have not screen shared it, and I meant to do that immediately. Um, I've lost you all. Where have you gone? It is. Um, okay, you see my share, right? I'm sorry, I, I lost the yep. whole my whole. We can see your share. Yeah, we can right. see your screen. Yeah, but what I've done is I've lost all of you somehow. Oh. Uh, a week oh, there we go. Okay, you. I got you. you. Somehow you went, you disappeared into my, you know, that thing that goes. Um, okay, so, um, so this is, so Rashma, so just thinking about, I don't know a lot of plays, right? So this, some of my, so I'm kind of talking about some sort of philosophical larger story issue things that have to do with basically having a group of these miraculous human beings on the page and basically suggesting to you that you have to come up with an answer that speaks to a change for all of them in order to gain a sense of unity of the piece. Okay. We, we basically start out with, we start out with five individuals in a sense, each doing their own thing. And through the course of the play, we have to end up with something that is unifying basically for that entire group. They go in a direction that is positive or negative. I think that that's what we have in the cherry orchard basically. So we have the cherry orchard, which is, I, I, I mean, it's been so long since I've read it or seen it. So I, I can't tell you the characters, but you essentially have five individual characters who are going through their life struggle. And then they get to the end point. And the end point is uh, difficult the, but the, there's a similarity in that they all must leave the house and the final tone of the piece is the chopping of the orchard. Oh, sorry, wait, wait is that? Yeah, right, the chopping of the orchard. So what it basically is saying is something about a passage of time. It's saying something about the entire group and even a uh, social organization, uh, you know, all of these things that essentially time is marching on, things are changing. Um, you, what, you, what they imagine in their lives as being a sense of permanence and you know, a kind of myopic permanence individually turns out to be erroneous essentially. And they, they, whether they learn it or not, the audience sees that time continues to pass regardless of how important they think their individual uh, circumstances are, they pale in a sense to this universal element of change. Okay. So that's what the reader takes away. Cherry Orchard is probably tragic for them individually, but okay. for us, we are changed because we learned something. We've been involved in these sort of petty, what, what, now become petty struggles in light of this larger universal truth. And, and I, I basically think you have that here and ready, ready to roll essentially because you've developed all of the individual struggles and now it's just a question of making, you know, sort of figuring out how you're going to get this family to a point of and I forget what happens in Cherry Orchard. Maybe one of the characters sort of understands what's happening and the rest of them don't. That sounds kind of typical or it kind of rings. Uh, but so that you can have that character that does have this sort of insight be able to help and lead the reader to come to that insight also. But it's still a circumstance that happens to all of them. So you can make some decisions about that. But I think that for me, I think, and it does remind me of the, the cherry orchard. You have this thing. It's like, it is like the, the hitting of the, the trees. Right. It's the algorithm. 
Yeah. Right? And the thing that strikes me about the algorithm, and I love this line, you said, don't be stupid. We might still have a chance if that thing, that algorithm thing works in our favor, right? I mean, this, this, the, the desire to have um, really, and we're going to talk about the algorithm just a little bit too, but, you know, so Baldev says that and really Chutki here, you know, is, is a person who has a deep, some deeper understanding, but she's saying the algorithm is not a fortune wheel, it's a calculator. Right. Right? And Simran doesn't have enough points to go the next round. I mean, that is such a profound statement. And, and I think, I mean, it gets to the much, much bigger, bigger heart of what's going on. And, and to me, it has ramifications. You have, you have that great line about India and everyone's buying air conditioners, but there's no, there's no fuel. There's not, there's not enough electric, electric infrastructure to run them all. Right. So they have the, they have, they have the non-working, you know, like in a sense, you can almost see like the, you know, there's all these non-working air conditioners they're speaking to a life that's going to come, and this I think this is very typical of human beings, you know, that's kind of like the carrot that's going to come later. We keep searching for that carrot that's going to come. Um, and, and in this case, too, it's it's not, it's like a, the algorithm, you know, it's not a wheel of fortune, it's a calculator. Um, it, it is really getting to such a profound truth between that juxtaposition for me, uh, philosophically, and I think in terms of our life issues, right? Because so there, there's this idea, almost a mystical idea, that there's this sense of fortune, you know, that anything is possible, right? Um, merely mystical and even magical thinking, right? So that, that kind of history. And Chotky says, it's a calculator. But more than that, it's not, it's not, I think there's a, there's a point to drawing some attention to what that even means. Because when it's a calculator, it's not a calculator made by, when it was fortune, it seemed as if it was, you know, something that's constructed by God in the universe. But when it's a calculator, it's something, to, it's something constructed by people. Right. And that's the case with this algorithm particularly, right? Right. So it's, it's a, it's a real it's a real crushing conflict of of world view um and i mean <clears throat> i don't think it should be even that chutki chutki here is you know she's enlightened to some kind of sense of truth it it has a cost right baldev's baldev's world view also comes with benefits right it comes with the benefit of not not seeing, right? We, we tend to think of like not seeing as being negative, right. but not seeing is also positive. It's optimistic. Chutke, yeah, right. But Chutki, Chutki is seeing that it's a calculator. There's nothing, you know, the calculator is a complete trap constructed by other people in which they're playing a part. They either go or they don't go according to someone else's construction. Right. That's a, that creates a kind of cynicism right, too, um, in which, and Chutki finds the escape from that cynicism in the fantasy of her shows. So I think you have, I think you have what you need in this piece, but it's a question of bringing all of these people, right now, it's like they're all, you're sort of continuing each of their individual threads. Right. But you need to start to funnel all of their threads into one crucial moment of and like very much like cherry orchards my 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 strong recollect recollection of it even though i saw it i mean at this point it might be <laughs> 30 years ago <clears throat> that basically something happens with the group of them that the cusp of realization of it isn't it isn't that chucky's right or baldov is right right it's a realization of what is what exists with both of those worldviews and also the worldviews of Simran and other characters, um, basically coming into a, a, a kind of confluence, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
And so I think that's all you got to do. <laughs> and this sounds a little abstract right now to get to that point, but maybe I'll just revisit Cherry Orchard and, and then re re revisit the play again uh, and see where I maybe, maybe. I, I I personally wouldn't I wouldn't do that because I wouldn't want to take that influence. Okay. I think what you have here is you have these wonderful characters, but you just have to figure out a way to have them basically you need to take all their individual things and figure out how to funnel them. Right. So it's really, you, you have the elements. I mean, you've done, you've done the work that I think is so important and brings us to what I think for the writer is the magical moment, okay? If people and characters, characters are miracles, people are miracles. So our first work is to gather them all. We can do that. We need to figure out how to do that, right? as writers. We need to figure out how to be able to see people and put them on the page without judgment and have them basically interact. And you've done that. And whatever we're writing, I, I always think of it, I think of writing as a gathering process where we gather all these things. And then, then I think we arrive at what's the magical moment for us as writers. Okay, so we've done the hard work of being able to absent ourselves and get these characters. Now, basically, we wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> we, we don't know. We can't, we can't, if, if we were, if we already knew what was going to happen in our story when we were gathering, we probably don't need to write our story. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is we don't know what's gonna happen. We're just gathering our, our human beings and we're putting them, we're trying to put them into the crucible right? We're putting them onto a lifeboat and we're having them like starts. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not that fond of it anymore. It struck me when I was in college, uh, no exit, right? But we're basically putting them onto a lifeboat and having them interact with each other in order to create the crucible from which we don't know what's going to occur. So I think you just have to now, now you have them all, you have so many great things here. You just have to figure out how to orchestrate it so it moves to that crucible. Okay. okay. And then, and then what happens after the crucible? By God, we don't even know. There's no articulation for it, but that's the magic that we're after. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So in my in in uh, here in the end, we have Baldev reject. You know, accepting that Simran is uh, not in for this marriage and. He says, well, I'll call up Raj and tell him Simran rejected him. So is that, uh, that that's the growth for Baldev. And that's, uh, uh, does that resolve it? Or is that resolution is not, it's easy. Yeah. I, I actually, you, you just told it to me and it gives me kind of chills. I think it does. I mean, I am, I am like, it's a futile gesture but it's a gesture, right? It's a gesture that says that we, we, are, we, are, we are taking the gesture of expressing some kind of will in a situation in which there is no, there's no outcome from that will. And I think that that is actually a beautiful thing. Okay. I, I would even, I would love to see you write that out. I mean, how, how can we get that on the page? How could we get Baldev Sit, calling and saying okay. it and it's not for Raj. it's not for raj it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily have it you might not even do it you might not you might even have the lights come down during it i don't know what you'll do but i would love to hear what he says when he comes around and he raj. says he he right. as we say in the u.s you know well i'm not okay i won't tell you what they, we say in the u.s but anyway he's going to call raj and reject raj i love it I love it. I do think that that works. Right. I'll, I'll do that. That's beautiful. So, uh, time check, Otis. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Otis. Yeah. Okay. Let me, um, let, I think, um, I'm not sure I, I emailed and I'm not sure that, um, let's see. Um, sorry, that's not my, sorry, Ashvani, I was not going to you. Um, 
I think S. Das. I'm not sure if S. Das is here. This is the first thing I think I've got, gotten from him or her. I don't know. Um, I just want to, uh, this is a review, so I just want to speak briefly about it. So um, we, we've talked about this before. So in this review, it's essentially a one-sided, one point of view uh, review. So <clears throat> I just wanted to repeat for all of you writing reviews, and this is true for all of our work. You know, when I go back to talking about the play and talking about uh, narrative and talking about people being mir miracles, we want to gather all the forces and then see what happens. That's what we want to do. That's dynamic action. We don't want to just present one side. So it's not, it's not a political point of view from, my, from my, my part, but we want to at least have these two points of view. We need to have the writer who is objective. We are able to have, as we're writing a review, we can be a reviewer, we can be an I, quote unquote I, within the review, and we can have our own biases. But the writer is managing this reviewer and this I as if they're a character, okay? They're one character. The writer is making characters on the page. The writer is above the fray. The writer is not in the fray fighting. I need to win, I need to win, I need to win, I need to win, right? and then just presenting their side of the fight. That is a very boring fight to watch, okay? I love Muhammad Ali, he's a master, but he's only a master when he's in the ring with George Foreman. He's only a master in the ring with George Foreman. Let's all remember that. Otherwise, he's just a guy standing in front of the ring, shadow boxing. Ashwani knows what I'm saying, I know, right? How long are you going to stand there watching someone shadow box? Oh boy, I'm so good. Buh, 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 buh. It's boring. So this is my quick talk. I just really want to get that through to everybody. One point of view is not anything that we can't write that way, no matter what. So, um, oh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So. So it's just very simple. I mean, I, I just use my boilerplate. It's not, it's not meant to be ideological. And I don't think it is ideological on my point. It's not that I don't agree with what, what's being written. I personally, whatever, who cares? That's me in the, in the fray. But as a writer, we have to present both points of view. The dynamics of our writing come from having protagonist and antagonistic forces. The force of our writing is actually, forget about protagonist who we feel is, you know, our, our ally. Let's just write antagonisms. Let's get the characters on the page, the points of view on the page. And then we see what happens. If we already know, this is, if we already know our conclusion, I'm going to encourage you, don't waste your time with it. You don't need to write it. You're not doing anything for yourself, right? Because you're actually just remaining even more so where you are. And that's not the point of our writing. Our point of our writing is actually for us to be transformed. We transform ourselves in our writing. That's the magic. Then we basically give that, transform, that transformative process that we've engaged in with our art to everyone else. So the, the book, the story, the play, the review even, the essay, all of those are simply an archive, a well-crafted archive of our transformative process with the art form. Yeah, so drop the mic. Ashwani, let's talk about your piece a little bit. Um, tell us, Ashwani, tell us a little bit about this piece. 
And I, uh, I've already seen your uh, comments and uh, the weak defense <laughs> which I have to offer is that, <laughs> uh, is that you know, I uh, imagined in my mind a scene and then it built into a story. And when I was writing it, I was trying to be very, very faithful to what I had imagined. And I was not looking at anything else. So, uh, I mean, I think I ignored some of the, uh, you know, advice which you've been giving us. And so therefore any rap on the knuckle is sort of acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ashwani, I, I really appreciate your writing. You are, you are a, a craftsperson with the language and I, I feel that, and I also think that what you were doing here, I, I respect what you're saying, because I think you were really trying to get into the point of view. I think you were very faithful to the point of view in this story, and I see that you were working on that. Um, you, you were also trying to imagine this other character, you know, so... This is the main thing in this piece, actually, the higher level thing. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting down on your, on your adverbs, but strangely, the adverbs actually speak to this other issue, because I don't think you write with so many adverbs when you're imagining other characters. But when you imagine this character a little bit stereotypically, right? Um, you, you went to these adverbs that made a kind of flourishy and even superficial, because that, I think adverbs are superficial, not to be too much of a tactician about it, but when you have words to describe um, verbs, you basically, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of flourish over nothing because actions are transitory. So it's, it's a bit empty, right? I mean, my, my joke is that an adverb so this is for everyone. My joke is that an adverb is a signpost that says weak verb ahead. But but that's but that's not really the issue. The issue is actually a deeper one, but I but I really want to I want to emphasize that I appreciate what you're trying to do. It is very hard to write a person. It's hard to write even ourselves because uh, is it is it uh, Oscar Wilde said only the shallow know themselves. <laughs> so, um, but so if we don't, can't even know ourselves how can we know someone else so this is a this is a big part of our work actually and so i think you know i think what you just said is really is really great you imagine this scene and you imagine this this woman uh with this backstory and you wrote down what you imagined and i think that that's really good work I think that the, the very high level that we're now talking about, so that's covering all the basics, um, is to actually get the human being on the page, not the stereotype of the human being. You know, um, there's, there's a story, I don't know if I told you this story before, but in the workshop, I, uh, there was this woman who, um, wrote, uh, she wrote a story, she was young, you know, same age as me in the workshop, she wrote a story, and it had a little old lady in it. And the little old lady uh, walked to the park, and she, she, she dropped something, and she happened to look through the bushes, and she saw this young couple making love. She was, she just picked up her things, she went home, she sat down in her chair, and she died. I, this is one of the few times, Ashwani, I was truly apoplectic in a workshop. And I, you know, I raised my hand to speak and I was like, I didn't know how to phrase what I wanted to say. But I said, I said to this, this woman who wrote the piece, I said, seriously, that woman knows more about sex than you do. She's lived her entire life. What are you talking about? She saw people having sex and she died? That's what you think? I, I was, 
<laughs> I throw up my hands. I don't know what to think. You know, I mean, uh, how can you explain, you know, this, this, this person thinking that, you know, a woman who's had a lifetime of experience would die because she saw a couple having sex. Anyway, um, that, that, ex that experience, I've always gone back to that story about, about this essential issue to like, that this is the real struggle though, because when we look at another person, we do our thinking of them, right? And what we actually have to do is figure out how to write them from their point of view, which is just as complex and, and very likely even more complex and certainly unknown to us, you know, it's more complex even than our point of view. You know, it's more complex than, than we are. This woman has made a lifetime of sacrifices, right? Living with this man who castigated her son for a petty infraction that was meaningless. The, uh, the simple thing to do though, so all of that is really hard right? It's, we can't really auto generate that stuff. So the way I think of us doing it as writers is that we, again, want to get those characters on the page in dynamic interaction. Here we have a protagonist, essentially, but we have no force of antagonism. And certainly the husband is right there. So it's absolutely fine that we don't know. I don't know other people. I don't. I don't know what it's like to live in their shoes from their perspective? I don't. So I basically use this tool of storytelling to investigate what it might be and try and be as truthful as possible, but by creating those forces of antagonism. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a great start. I think it's ambitious. It's an ambitious story. Um, I... <laughs> I have a very, very embarrassing story to tell about me and workshop where I did this, you know, this tried to imagine from another point of view. And I, I honestly, I can't even tell the story. It's too embarrassing. Um, but, um, but I think you're on the right track because you're really struggling to do it and you're really reaching deeply into it. Ashwani, the other thing is I do want to suggest to you, did, did I suggest that you read check off already? Yes, you do. Have you read Chekhov? Uh, I started uh, just read a, <laughs> No, I read a few stories. Uh, yeah. You know, there are two reasons why I've had a temporary stop. I won't say that I'm not going to read them. I will read them again. Firstly, I had uh, a row of submissions back to back, which I had to do. I write for some journals. And the second reason was that uh, I find that you know the stories don't have a surprise ending which is what i look forward to something like you know uh, o henry oh. or something like that so i you find like that o uh, henry. yeah yes. uh, you like the o henry type stories yes um, i mean if there is a choice yes <laughs> uh huh uh huh um, yeah well this story sort of reminded me of like maupassant um, the necklace, I think I wrote in the bottom. I didn't know how to spell Maupassant. Um, but yeah, it reminded me of that. I was going to bring up the other little thing to bring up for all of us as writers. So this story here has a chiasmus model to some degree, right? The, do you know the chiasmus model? So like the necklace is very much that. Um, so this is actually another thing that you can bring to bear to this story if you wanted to in order to develop, in a sense, that surprise ending. Because the surprise ending is a function of chiasmus. It does exist in the Chekhov stories and other stories, but it, it, it basically is a, um, it's more apparent in the O. Henry type story, Yes. right? So like, so like in Maupassant, the woman, you know, um, borrows the necklace, right? She's vain, she wants to borrow the necklace, but then she loses it and then you know she's she ruins her entire life because of it and then she finally earns all the money to pay the woman back for the for the borrowed necklace because of her vanity 
And, uh, and what she learns is, well, the necklace was just made out of glass anyway. She never would have trusted her with the thing anyway. So, so this woman who's absolutely vain learns a sense of integrity. And then we basically get the kicker that lets us understand the irony of the situation, right? So it's just very obvious. But that chiasma, chiasmus model basically exists in the Chekhov stories too. It exists in all stories. If you think about it in relationship to this story, so what we really need is, <clears throat> so, so if we think about Chiasmus with this story, the entire story really exists with the son stealing the earrings for the mother, right? And then the mother, and then the, the, the child is basically disowned by the father. And, you know, let's say he has to be elsewhere and, and they've completely lost that relationship. So actually, in order to understand this story, we actually have to know the mother's relationship to those earrings, right? It's as if, like the, like the necklace story by Maupassant, that maybe she really likes the earrings. Maybe she even said to her son, oh, I wish I could have those earrings, right? And then the son steals them for her, yes. right? And now at the end, then she receives the earrings. Here, mother, here are the earrings that I never could have given you before. And then the mother realizes, you know, basically her own folly. But that's, but you'll see that then in this story, the entire focus actually ends up being on the mother. And she is essentially complicit in what happens. She's not simply a victim of what happens. Right. So the difference between Chekhov stories, whatever little I've read, and O. Henry, and to some extent Maupassant, is that there the, the surprise ending is more concrete, while here the surprise ending is uh, just a twist of a uh, sentence, you know, the way it is said, uh, that is the surprise. But there the surprise is more concrete, like the gift of the Magi, or the cop and the anthem, uh, the story has got a very concrete surprise at the end. Right. The, the, reversal, the reversal is not just a sudden irony. The reversal is um, a, 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 reverse, a reversal of character, basically. A reversal of character. That's the, that's the change. So in one story, it's just ir irony. But in, in the Chekhov story, it's change of character. That thing that I said, we gather all our forces and then we come up with this. If you read, for example, I'm sure you read The Lady with the Pet Dog, right? The beginning of that story has this cad, uh, Gurov. Gurov is just a cad. He just wants to get this lady with a pet dog into bed. At the end, he can't live without her, right? He doesn't even know how that happened. So he's been completely transformed. We begin here and we go there. Um, what, uh, something else, oh, but like on the, on the ironic ending, Ambrose Bierce, uh, a curl at Owl Creek uh, Bridge, you know, this person is being hung and, uh, but, but it, the rope snaps and he escapes and he's going through this place, da 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 da, da and at the end of the story, his neck snaps. Uh, the Lottery by Shirley Jackson. I will tell you a story about that sometime too that involves me embarrassing myself with the grandson of Shirley Jackson. A story I always hated, Ashwani, I'll tell you. Uh, they have a lottery, everyone's expecting something amazing and at the end someone gets the one and then she's stoned to death. Uh, you know, I do not do not describe that story to the grandson of the writer of the story. That's my advice to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but I think you you understand your work. I, I I feel that, and I and I, you know, I I love your writing. So I I know you are. The writer's life is struggle. The writer's life is not success. That's. But that, those are some true words. <laughs> I only have one thing to add that when we are writing, we think we are a success, but when it undergoes your uh, comments, then it is no longer a success. 
<laughs> no, Ashwani, I really want to push back on that. It is a success. This is this is great work. We are we are just like characters. We are on a path. Um, Martin Buber says all travelers are on a journey of which they do not know the destination. We are just a character in our own story. So it is a success. You wrote this story. It's very successful. It's very successful that I am functioning as your antagonist and I am saying these things. And from that we grow and we continue on our path. And um, I really appreciate that. I, re I really gratefully accept your comments and I'm sure they add value every time I listen to them. In fact, I listen to them again and again later. Oh, well, Ashwani, you have, you have some incredible stories and I just look forward to continue reading them. Thank you Otis, for your comments. Yeah. Uh, talking uh, about Anton Shekhar, I remember the story called Chess. Uh, I don't remember, I, I, I'm, I'm correct with the title of the story, but it was so amazing. I read in school and it has stayed, I'll, I'll stay with me forever, actually. Uh, the Chess by Anton Shekhar. I hope the title is right, Otis. Yeah. I'm, okay. uh, I'm, the, the title isn't ringing a bell for me right now, but I think that that's, you know, there's some stories that influence us that that I go back to the big story for me is James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues. Ashvani, I'll suggest that one also to you. Um, the other, another collection, Ashvani, that you might look at, I, I say check off to you because you have a little bit of an old timey style, but you might look at um, a, another collection of short stories that I think is brilliant is uh, Raymond Carver's What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. That is a, if you're a short story writer, I suggest that to all of you. It's a... Uh, so, it's uh, time check, uh, Otis, I wanted to... Uh, we have about 25 minutes, so okay. we could probably Let me, go over we one or two have, pieces. Okay, let's talk, it, let's talk to Ram. We just have the one piece left. Ram, let's get you on the video. Hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Okay. So, Ram, why don't you tell us about the review? Uh, okay, so this uh, I got this book from the Indic uh, Book Club as part of a review program. So I read the book and I wrote the review. Uh, so I had sent you two reviews. So one, the second review that I had sent was uh, one that I wrote after your inputs on writing a review. And this I had written before I got those uh, inputs on writing a review, but I thought, let me send both of them so that uh, at least for me, I know what mistakes I'm making because I can clearly see the learning curve. Uh, so this is the review I had written on that book. Uh, so I had mixed feelings about the book. So I like the storyline. I like the uh, social message that they had carried, but I had a lot of issues with the uh, execution of the plot line, the storyline, the whole execution of the book. So that's, mm -hmm. that's why my comments, some of the comments were like, you know, a bit vitriolic, but after going through your sessions, now I know what should be done and what should not be done in a book, because right. a book review is an opportunity, not for me to put out my personal views for that. I can write a blog post. I can write an essay. I can go and rant on Facebook. A book review is not the place to do that. That I know now. Right. Well, the, the thing for us when we're writing a review is to recognize that we get to, we get to play <clears throat> basically two roles. We get to play two roles. Um, we get to be the writer of the review and we can be a character in the review who has biases. So I, I do wanna, I, I wanna say that it's okay for us to have a character that's us who has a bias. Okay. But we as the writer have to be able to represent both sides mm -hmm. in a sense. So like, like here, and, and actually, what, what you do is you sort of don't, in this review, interestingly, and of course, this is what we do, we know that we're not supposed to be in the piece, kind of, so that we end up being a writer with bias. Mm. So I, that's what I wanted you to get away from. I, I'm not trying to tell you all, you know, like everyone on earth not to have their bias. Yeah. We're human beings. We have our bias because we have our point of view. But as a writer, we have to see more expansively. Right. So like here, I think in this review, you really just need your I character to come out and say, I personally picked up this book because I want to read a murder mystery. In that regard, it fails. Mm. However, 
the authors seem to be driven by a desire to write a social commentary. Right. And in regard to social commentary, their commentary is important. Hmm. Right now I've said those two things. Now I combine them and say, um, to, to include a social commentary in a murder mystery does a disservice to both, hmm. right? right. Um, it, it, it ruins the murder mystery and it diminishes the social commentary. But, right. but the social commentary is important and it, and, it, and it finds an access to a wider audience than might otherwise read sociology textbooks. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. You know, so, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be like fancy or anything. I'm just covering the two sides. Oh, and then that, yeah. You know, and, and then, and then I want to say something and I want to say something more complicated than don't buy this book. Right. Yeah. And you said this wrong. You have it in here. It's just not organized as such. Yeah, that's true. Right. That's all. That's yeah. the only difference. And, and, uh, and it's a little bit because you're not playing the real two roles for us in in uh, in our writing of a review is the book is just a foil in a sense for us to cover two sides of an argument, our bias and our objectivity. That basically the objective point of view covers the other side, basically covers the author's, the, the book's point of view. And basically puts then our bias against this book point of view and it puts them back and forth, and then it comes to some kind of conclusion, which for me, I like to make complex. Mm. You know, where it fails, where it fails as sociology, it succeeds in terms of audience appeal. Right. This is, this is, this is in the direction of a psychologically complex murder mystery that I hope the authors might attempt next, mm. right? Yeah. I don't know. You, you know, like, so then you're, you know, I didn't know I was going to get there in the beginning, but it's right. just, once we, once we engage in this process, this is the writer's process. The writer's process is to, you know, like uh, Rashma's play, right? She doesn't just write one character. As a, she's trying to put all the characters on. Right. We as a writer, we want to be able to separate ourselves and understand ourselves as a character. We develop that, um, what I call a dual consciousness, right? right. And it's yeah. a pop psychology term where we understand ourselves as a character, as a human being, and we also elevate above that so that we can see a broader picture. Yeah, uh, you're, you, you, you got, you, you know what you're doing. I love fact, some of the comments. In fact, while writing this review, I, I could feel myself uh, in a tug of war. On the one side, I wanted to be objective as a reviewer and on the other side, the personal biases were coming in. So if you read this review, you'll probably see the parts where, okay, on the, uh, in few passages, this fellow is pulling, on the other passages, the other chap is pulling. So you can actually see that. <laughs> Totally. I totally see that. I totally get out of this that you are conflicted, yeah. right? I totally see that you're conflicted. And this, so this is the joy of writing is that we basically, we, we have a conflict and what we do is we separate them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We separate them into uh, um, identified um, points of view, essentially. So one point of view is a biased point of view and one point of view is an objective point of view. Right. That's what we do as writers, precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and out of your conflict, there's so many great points that you're making here. I, I really enjoy the points. And it's just it's a question, it's like this. And it's just a question like going like this. And then we have a paragraph, 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 paragraph. Yeah. So Otis, I have a question here. When, uh, when, when writing a... a... I know you're breaking up. I think we lost Abhinav. Nope. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah. Ah, okay. Thanks. Uh, so I was saying, sir, whether I'm writing a positive review or if I, whether I'm critical of it, 
how much value is there in in quoting a line or two from the book to make my point as a reviewer um yeah, i i think it's a good idea because it means that you're basing what you're writing on something that's tangible you know from the mm -hmm. book itself so yeah and and i think that you know again i'll go i'll go back to this idea though you know, we're, we're, we're all in a learning process here, but the point I'm making to Ram too is we, I don't think we're finally really writing either a positive or negative review. What we want to end up doing is writing because the book has been published. So there must be something there that's something, right? Some, someone yeah. thought that there was some reason to have this thing published. So we want to find something complex. And that's where we want to be like, so, you know, with Ram's is like, as a book of sociology, you know, it, it, it's more exciting than your average book of sociology. But if you're looking for sociology that pushes the envelope on these issues, you might look to this, 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 and this. However, if you want a murder mystery with some, um, in, with some sociology, you know, we say something complex to a broader audience. Um, and then we actually let the reader make up their mind. Oh, I am looking for that. Oh, I'm not looking for that. Um, Rams, th this this review is a good one because he's not. He actually says a lot of negative things about the book, but he says it's worth reading because of where it, where it functions in a kind of development of writing, and I think that that's probably important. You know. But yes, yeah, I think quoting, uh, quoting things, particularly if you get to the heart of something through the quote, that would be advantageous. Um, this work, this is a core issue. Blah, da, 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 da. Uh, this is the core issue of the book. And uh, it's an important one for everyone to consider. However, when we look at sentences like da, 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 we see that the writing gets in the way of the clarity of the ideas. Um, okay, I think we're, that's a wrap. And um, I look forward to getting some work uh, next week and seeing you all again. I can't hear you, Abhinav. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Abhinav, I couldn't hear you. Abhinav, you are muted. You are muted, Abhinav. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that. I was saying thank you, Otis, and can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're yes, right. yes. Yes, yes, we hear you. Uh, you can't hear us. Yeah. Okay. So I, am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible. Thank you. So uh, to conclude, thank you, Otis. And uh, folks, please send in your pieces, writing pieces, reviews, submissions uh, a few days in advance so that uh, Otis has enough time to read, review, and uh, send in your feedback. And uh, do let others know also. Uh, I will tweet and I'll put this on our Facebook page and also send out a newsletter. So hope to talk to you next uh, Sunday then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you, Otis. Thank you very much, Bye. Otis. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.